We are going to be talking today about manhood in the Me Too era. And by now, just about everyone must be aware of the Me Too movement. It's demand for an end to all levels of sexual assault against women and really all levels of sexual assault about human beings across the spectrum of gender. It's a demand that everybody be treated with the respect that each of us deserves. And it's a watershed moment for social justice and one that, though it... It's late in coming, as all movements for social justice are. It couldn't be more welcome by people of conscience across the world. I want to take a moment before introducing our extraordinary guest to introduce or reintroduce you to two of my books that are closely related to the subject that we're going to be talking about today. The first is Making Love, Playing Power with the subtitle, Men, Women, and the Rewards of Intimate Justice. Making Love Playing Power helps men and women who want to improve their relationships take a critical look at gender, and in particular, traditional masculinity. The book provides specific recommendations and exercises that can help us, us being men, break free from the damaging effects of much of what we have been taught about how to be in the world and how to bring ourselves into our most important relationships. Making Love Playing Power also puts the work of improving our relationships within the larger frame of race, sexual orientation, social class, the larger social context. And my latest book is called Simple Habits of Exceptional But Not Perfect Parents. None of us are perfect. I know I'm not. Maybe you are. I'm not sure. And it extends this work of creating healthy relationships to the world of parenting and takes a very focused look at our use of power as parents and gives practical descriptions of daily habits that we can practice, habits that can help our kids develop into their full potential. Both of these, of course, are available on Amazon. So I am thrilled to have my guest with me for the hour. His name is Ted Bunch, and Ted is an educator, an activist, and a lecturer working to end all forms of violence and discrimination against women and girls. He is co-founder of A Call to Men, the organization whose work Gloria Steinem has called the basis for world peace. Ted is internationally recognized for his efforts to prevent violence against woman, women while promoting a healthy, respectful manhood. He's the former director and co-creator of the largest program for domestic violence offenders in America. His innovative work laid the foundation for the prevention strategies that are now endorsed as best practice in engaging men to end violence against women. Ted developed and implemented model response programs for police, fire departments, medical technicians, paramedics, other first responders in dealing with domestic violence. He's an advisor to the National Football League, the National Basketball Association, the National Hockey League, Major League Soccer, and Major League Baseball. Ted was a guest presenter for the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women and a lecturer for the U.S. State Department. You can learn more about Ted and his organization at www.acalltomen.org. Also, www.liverespect.org. In particular, if you go to a call to men.org, take a look at the blog, a call to men blog. And there are some entries there that are particularly revealing. One is called I Will Speak Up. It was, it was posted on October 29th of 2017. One is Proven Strategies to Prevent Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. And that one was posted on January 17th, 2018. Ted, it is a great privilege to have you with us. Oh, thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. And uh, good afternoon to your audience. So tell tell us first about A Call to Men, how it was founded, how it was how it was envisioned, let's say even before it was founded, what led you to it? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, A Call to Men, we've been in existence for we're just celebrating our 16th uh, 16th year. 
Um, I call them and educate men all over the world on healthy, respectful manhood and preventing violence against women, sexual assault and harassment, bullying, and many other social ills. Our mission is to create a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful and all women and girls are valued and safe. We really believe that as we increase and promote a healthy, respectful manhood that values women and girls, we also decrease and prevent domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, bullying, homophobia. It just can't exist when we have healthy, respectful manhood. So. Tony Porter was the original visionary for A Call to Men, and um, thank you for mentioning our website. If people want to go to the website, uh, one thing that they can share with other people about the work of A Call to Men, or even about um, uh, um, the message they'll hear today, is uh, our TED Talk. He has he did a TED Talk a few years back, and um, GQ Magazine said it was one of the top TED Talks every man should see, and I agree with that. It's just uh, it's about 11 minutes long, and it covers the issue of naming the problem as it relates to men's violence against women, and the solution. And when I say men's violence against women, I want to make clear to your audience that um, if we look at the rates of violence, not only in the United States, but around the world, the overwhelming majority of violence against women and girls is men's violence, but the overwhelming majority of men are not violent, but we're silent about the violence other men perpetrate. And that silence is as much of the problem as the violence is. And that's where the work of a call to men is, is in the silence of the men who are not perpetrating the violence and not intentionally harming women or discriminating against women, which is the majority of us. And it's not an indictment on manhood. But it's actually an invitation to, to men. So we started this organization because whenever we deal with anything, uh, Ken, you know very well, um, as it relates to violence against women in particular, um, well, you look at the most recent sexual harassment. When the allegations started coming out in, in October, um, they became part of the national conversation. About four years ago, when there was a, um, an athlete who was seen on film being violent, uh, toward his wife, well, then, Ray Rice, right. then it became right. Then it became part of the national conversation. Well, that's all intervention. Something has to happen, and then we respond to it. We go upstream to prevention, where it never happens in the first place. That's where our work is: is in the prevention space. How do we stop it from helping, happening in the first place? So that bridge from intervention to prevention, that bridge is men that we have to be part of the solution. So Tony came to me about, well, it was about 20 years ago now that we actually started talking about the organization. We, we became a 501c3 16 years ago, but we worked together about four or five years before that, developing this analysis and this concept. And it was really born out of the battered women's movement, actually, believe it or not. He and I both worked um, in batterers programs, meaning domestic violence offenders. I ran the largest program in the country here in New York City um, for then an organization called Safe Horizon, uh, excuse me, Victim Services. People would know it now as Safe Horizon. But it was the largest program for domestic violence offenders, meaning um, these, were, these were men, actually, who were either violated orders of protection uh, or were violent in some way or abusive in some way. They were in the court system, and they were given the batterers program as an option opposed to jail. So, and if they didn't comply with the batterers program, then they would go to jail. So we had about 600 men a week, 26-week program. It was a huge program. And as I'm doing that work, and Tony was doing similar work in upstate New York, um, we started to um, just discuss the issue of um, male socialization. And we had a number of women who were leaders in the work, who, um, in, meaning in the woods movement, who were patient enough and kind enough to really help us develop this analysis, um, really looking at how men in, uh, are in this sexist society, how male dominance plays out. And then we started just to really want to talk to all men that to break the silence, knowing that the solution is in men, because if most of the problem is men, then most of the solution is going to be men as well. So we just started developing this analysis, and really it was more of a bystander intervention. Say something, do something. You know, if someone in your family is calling, you know, his wife or girlfriend, you know, the B word, or if he's being abusive, or if he's saying things that are disrespectful, you know, confront him on that in a loving way, but in an accountable way. And we move from that quickly into going drilling deeper and deeper and deeper into this thing around male socialization the collective socialization of manhood that those men who do something that we would say crosses the line and those men who don't that that's a very thin line and actually 
even for men to be able to say that the line is there, like where the line is, speaks to our entitlement and privilege, right? Because the line for that woman may be much earlier on than what we're saying the line should be drawn. So we started having these conversations and developing this analysis really around prevention and looking at the collective socialization of manhood, that all men, regardless of whether they're uh, men who engage in something that's disrespectful to women or not, that we've all been taught the same messages, learned the same things, have been socialized in the same way. And I'll give three quick examples, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Ken. And this is what all men are socialized. Not that you believe it, but, we, but we're socialized too. First example is having less value for women and girls. That's something that we're all taught. Again, not that you or your listening audience believes that girls and women have less value than men and boys, because they don't, but these are the things we're taught. For example, if I go to any city, country, um, excuse me, city, county, town in our wonderful United States, and I go to a baseball field right now today, I'll hear a father, an uncle, a coach, a big brother, a, a, a young man say to a little boy who's six years old, and I've done these things before also, Ken, it's not an indictment, it's an invitation, right? Well, we'll say things like, son, you have to throw hard on that. You throw like a, right? You, yep. Everyone in your listening audience can answer that question. Or like a girl. That's right. Now, it doesn't mean that we believe girls throw in ways that are in, in, inferior to boys, but we know the answer to that. So we've been socialized to know the answer to that. So what does that six-year-old boy leave from that interaction with that man who he's learning how to play baseball from? Does he leave thinking girls are equal to him or less than him? Well, less than him. How can he not? And we're giving these messages all through our every day these boys are getting messages and the girls are getting messages and we're giving these messages also as men so less value is something that we're all taught and by the way this is true universally the the the, the issue is universal the problem is universal but the solution is also when i'm in the uk when i'm in uh, anywhere else in Europe, I've been in South Africa, I've asked the men the same thing. When I'm in a group of men, I'll ask them. I won't use the, the example of a boy throwing a baseball. I'll use the example of a six-year-old boy learning how to kick a football, meaning a soccer ball. And I'll, and I'll pitch it out. I remember in South Africa, I pitched it out to these men. I said, he's six years old, you're teaching him how to play football, a soccer ball, and you, and you say you have to kick hard on that, son. You kick like a... And I threw it out to them, and they all said, girl... It's the same thing, because where there's it's, sexism and patriarchy, there's less yep. value for women and girls. So yep. less value. The other is property. See, that we're mm -hmm. taught that women are the property of men. And if I'm in anywhere in the United States right now, Ken, and I walk over to a man who just hit his wife or girlfriend, he did something terrible, and I walk over to him and say, knock it off, or you can't do that, he's going to say what to me? Mind your business. Yep. Right? She belongs it's a private to matter. It's a private matter. And who does that privacy serve? Men. It's a private matter. Actually, there's three women a day in, in our country right now, Ken, who are killed every day from domestic violence. Three a day. We lose more women to domestic violence every day than we lose soldiers in the war. I don't think we lose three soldiers in the wars that we're in. Right? Now, I don't and, know, and, I and Ted, I'll jump in. I'll jump in and say that that fact that it's not known is further evidence of how we devalue women. Exactly, exactly, Ken. And I bring that statistic up because it tells us a lot. We have three women a day who are killed. 75% of those women who are killed are killed once she decides to leave or has left. In other words, if he comes home and sees that she's gone, he goes and finds her and kills her. Or if she says, I'm not gonna be here when you get back home, he kills her. That speaks to the issue of property. If I yep. can't have you, nobody can have you. You belong to me. So it's less value, property. And then the third main um, uh, teaching uh, that's unhealthy, that's harmful, is that we're taught to uh, sexually objectify women. That's one of the things, that's one of the ways we bond with each other as men is by objectifying women. And we teach that to our boys. We teach that yep. to our boys every day. They, they're expected to objectify girls and women. Those three things yep. are the main kind of conversations we have around men and deconstructing all of that in a way that invites men, that, 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 uh, that has, we have these conversations with love for men, um, but we really want to touch the hearts of men. And, and as, you, as you talk about 
the rules. Don't act like a girl. Women are my property and yeah. and you are your body. You are your mm-hmm. your ability to provide sex. That extends to queer people as well. Don't act Absolutely. anything like a person who's gay. That we are certainly that heterosexual people are certainly better. That mm-hmm. in gay Absolutely. relationships too, it's all about the way he looks or she looks often. And and the the code the way I see it extends further from there. It's keep your feelings to yourself. It's work is your first priority. It's be self-reliant. Don't be collaborative or cooperative. Be aggressive, be dominant. And yeah. and another just big part of it is don't be gay or anything like it. Now, when we, when we have a chance to talk a bit further about this, we're coming up to a break. One of the things I want to I want us to explore, and I and I appreciate very much that you're saying that it's with love, but I I'll bet you that there are men who are listening to this and they're saying, okay, this is just another male bashing conversation, just another male bashing conversation, and and I I want us to be able to talk about about two things. And, and you're laying the groundwork very nicely. One is that this is an invitation. This is not an attack. And two is that we do, in fact, practice these rules and our abuse of power across a continuum from which, if we're very honest with ourselves, none of us are completely apart. That's right. Yep. And so Agreed. as we we're going to we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk more about this. We're just talking about some of the rules that boys and men are subject to as we're growing up. Things like don't throw like a girl and keep your feelings to yourself, those sorts of things. And what what we want to talk about is the fact that None of us are, as Ted was saying, none of us are bad people. We're well intended, really for the most part. So how do we look at this? How do we look at ourselves and not say that's not me or this is all about bashing men or there's 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 us good men over here and there's those really violent, abusive men over there. So I'm going to throw all that to Ted and ask you to comment. <laughs> sure, happy to. Well, first of all, um, this is never about male bashing in any way. This is really about believing that men can make a difference and that it's really um, uh, that we've been, that there's been some t- t- some things that we've learned about manhood. Listen, I don't want to not be a man. I enjoy being a man. I enjoy being a father. <laughs> So I'm not trying to change that, um, but I am trying to, you know, look at some of the things that we do as men that we've just are on remote control with. We just we just go through our lives, and and as you say, we're for the most part we're really good men doing the right thing, and we're doing the right thing in our world. And 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 what we want to do is extend our concern for um, uh, for uh, for women and girls all around us, for those who don't conform to gender at all, all around us. This is really important. And you had mentioned it earlier, the issue of um, homophobia as well. Um, these are all things that we need to challenge. And I know that you do quite a bit of that in both of the books that you've written. You've covered some of this very well. So when we look at inviting men to the conversation, that's really what we want to do. We want to invite men and say, look, we've all, myself included, you know, I'm continuing to learn what it is to be a man. I'm continuing to understand what my male privilege is. And that's one thing that I think men sometimes get a little bit um, tight around, that this is some way challenging who we are as men. But we do have male privilege. We do have entitlements and privileges, and we pass them down from one generation to the next generation. And we do things on remote control with the best of intentions. So I'm a good guy doing the right thing, but I also, just like, the example I gave around the girl being the boy being told that he feels like a girl, we're trying to teach that boy to 
to be more aggressive maybe with the ball, to throw harder. But we're doing it at the expense of girls, and we often do that. We often motivate each other and inspire each other even at the expense of women and girls. And I'll just give you a quick example of that. You know, I've been doing this work for well over 20 years, and about 10 years ago I'm going out to do the work of a call to men, which is really anti-sexism work. Right, And all of us, are we, as men, we're raised in a society that is sexist, right? So we're kind of, it's kind of embedded in our socialization, not in our DNA, but in our socialization. I want to give you an example of how well-meaning I was at this time, but how sexist it was also. I'm going to, um, going to the airport to, to um, do a presentation around the work of a call to men, ending violence against women, ending violence and discrimination against women and girls. And we would always have a ritual, my son and I, he's 21 now, he was about 11 then. He would always be the last one to walk me out to the car and give me a hug and kiss. He's my oldest son. I have four children. He's the oldest. Uh, we have a daughter who's uh, older than him, but he's the oldest son, and he would always walk me out. So I'd kiss everybody goodbye, and then he would walk me out to the car. He'd pull my laptop bag behind him, and it was a very proud moment for both of us. It was our time together, our bonding moment, like many fathers and sons, dad leaving the house, and I leaned down to my son, and I said to him what so many fathers say to their boys when they leave the house. I said to him at 11 years old, right, take care of things around here. You got it, son? I got it, Dad. Be the man of the house. All of those wonderful things. Yeah. Now, that's great. I'm teaching him to be a protector. I'm teaching him responsibility, to be a leader, to be accountable. I'm teaching him all these wonderful things. And it occurred to me, wait a minute. What am I really saying to my son? I'm teaching him all these things at the expense of his mother because I'm also saying... You're the man of the house because she needs one. You got it because she doesn't. Take care of things around here because she needs you to. I didn't lean down to my daughter and say that, I lent, I le and even, even though she was older. So I give that as an example that with the best of intentions and the wonderful, I'm, I'm a great dad. I really am. <laughs> I really am. That's one thing I'm really comfortable saying. But even me, knowing all that I knew, was still motivating my son at the expense of his mom or of women and we do those things all the time so this is not an indictment on manhood it's just us looking at ourselves and looking at how is part of what if i've learned things that are not correct about men and women what if i have what what would what would that mean for me and that's what we really have to look at what would that mean for us if you know everything that we knew about manhood wasn't correct well as as you're talking i think it's just so brilliant to emphasize that it, it happens by autopilot. It's so embedded in us. We've, we've heard these messages since, since the time we were little that, that boys should play with certain kinds of tools which are general, or toys which are generally more active toys, that boys are doers and, and that girls are more staying back and, and providing support. All of these, I mean, just go on and on with the messages. And, and how do we how do we create a new layer of vigilance so that we can we can see what we're about to say, what we're about to do before it comes out? I think that that's one of the big challenges when it comes to any sort of attempt to address the fact that I'm sexist, the fact that I am racist, the fact that I'm homophobic. All of those things is is to is to first to admit it and, and get past the denial, the guilt, the exceptionalism, exceptionalizing it's not me, the minimizing mm -hmm. I only do it a little bit, and to say, look, this is something that I've been brought into and if I can pay attention to it and I can catch myself, I'm gonna be on a path to a fuller kind of adulthood. That's the way I think about it. And one of the things, that I think is so very di difficult is that if a man hears another man disparaging a woman or objectifying a woman, he is generally going to feel, as you mentioned in the beginning, so compelled to either corroborate or to be silent. And and right. one of the things that that I think about is there are wonderful things that men are taught too. We're taught to be courageous, Absolutely. for example. And what if courage 
is all about the courage to fight against bias of all kind. What if courage isn't about going along with anybody who puts down anybody else or who violates anybody else? But what if a man is – part of being a man is, is not to stuff your feelings. It's to acknowledge your feelings, to acknowledge when you feel like you're hearing about somebody being hurt and to stand up. And, and to say something to another man. The, those are the kinds of challenges I think it's just so important for us to, to share with each other because the pressure is so yeah. heavy. And, and I bet a lot of men who are listening to this are saying, well, like, if I heard something like that, I would say something immediately. And my challenge is watch, watch yourself, feel what you feel and see if you can. Yeah, I mean, you, you you bring up so many really good points here, and I think that um, when we talk about principles of healthy, respectful manhood, right, that includes embracing us and expressing a full range of emotions, right? Mm-hmm. Because what we wind up expressing as men, the only emotion we're really allowed to express with each other is anger, and anger is really a secondary emotion. You know, we're feeling sadness and pain and hurt most of the time, but we never get to express that because when we were that four-year-old boy expressing it, everyone told us to man up, suck it up. You don't feel that way. Only girls feel that way. You're not, you know, you got to toughen up. So we, we, so we bury these feelings. And actually, there's a direct connection between uh, men and boys who adhere to rigid traditional notions of gender roles and masculinity are more likely to report using violence against their partner and also... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, um, it, it's it's also linked to um, uh, um, poor health. So you know yep. we're living as men on average dying from stress-related illnesses about six years earlier than women because these this emotional stress that never gets these emotional stresses that never get expressed we bury and it actually builds itself into a physical manifestation of stress later on and it's killing us. Yep. So we really have to be able to be okay with not always conforming to being the pressures of, like you say, the pressures of always being fearless and in control. You know, those are really important things. And we have to work toward our full humanity. You know, there's so much that, there's so much for us to gain by looking at this. We have the concept called the man box yep. and how we yep. have to live in the man box. And you brought up a lot of the, <laughs> the uh, characteristics of the man box, yep. um, uh, Ken, you know, and there's wonderful things, being a protector, being courageous. And I love your, your definition of courageous being being a provider all of those are great things we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater but you know women can also be providers and be protectors too you know so yep. so it's not exclusive to men but some of the other things are always having to be in control not asking for help yep. not showing fear all of those things and so women are much closer to what we at a call to men would say the full range of humanity, being able to express your feelings, being able to be vulnerable, all of those things. We want to get there too, because we're missing out on a lot. You know, we, one of the ways we define ourselves as men is by distancing ourselves from the experiences of women. And part of that distance is, you know, and again, it's through this lens of male, um, male privilege, I would say, and a lot of us who have it don't necessarily see that we have it. And so what if it was true, though? And when we see, when we, when we, when we look at um, things that are happening for, toward women, right, and being involved with um, things becoming better for women, a lot of us think that if we're doing something for women, then that's somehow against men. And that's just not true. You know, it's just not true. And even Ted, for, me, for me, it's important to, mm-hmm. to, if I may jump in, it's, it's important yes, to, to talk about and people who have been with me through these past several weeks have probably heard me mention this at least once before to talk about power and that we live in a world where power is domination for the most part and if we think about world if we think about power as domination then the only way to understand it is what you said is that if somebody is gaining power i must be losing it right. instead of right. instead of power as responsibility for shared health, for mm-hmm. for shared success in a power with world. If somebody else is gaining power, we're all gaining power. We're all gaining good things. There's an abundance of power. There's not a fixed amount of power. So if we, it, but it's so hard to move from that, that way of thinking about domination, like power is yeah. domination. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's I jumped really right. In. 
No, no, you're absolutely right. And and that's really what we have to, you know, that we're not, it's just not us giving up things as men. It's really about what we can gain. And there's so much that we can gain because what happens is we, be, we can really become our authentic selves, that I can really share a who, all of who I am with you and I can be vulnerable and it's not a sign of weakness. So um, So when we look at talking to men about these things, it's really around loving and supporting them through it. This is not against men in any way. It's really about that, you know, this is... Us, me just being a good man is not enough. Like, we all need to get more involved. So even with the Me Too um, uh, movement that's happening this time in our society, which is extremely, I think, exciting to me, because it's long overdue that all men are looking at how we impact the world in a different way since October, you know, uh, especially in the workplace. And I have to say that I don't think that there's any man who hasn't either done something or said something that has crossed the line, I'm using that term again, as it relates to sexual harassment or devaluing women, or witnessed another man doing something or saying something and did nothing about it, including myself. There were times, I remember before I did this work, where I'd be at the workplace and and hear a sexist joke and didn't say anything about it. We've all done things like that. So there's so none of us are free from it, and we and and the the conditions of today really force us to take a look at ourselves, which is a really good thing, because we can all benefit from it. If I could just share a quick story about why it's important that we're all involved, do I, do I have do I have time to do that, Ken? You've got about two minutes before the break. Okay, um, and we and we can keep going with it after that if we need to. Okay, great. All right, so. <laughs> My daughter's 28 now. She, she's uh, she graduated the University of Virginia about six years ago, and uh, we live on Long Island. And University of Virginia, of course, is in Charlottesville. It's about a six-hour drive. And I just want the men in the audience, in particular, to imagine, you know, you're six hours away from your child. You know, if she or he was to need you, and you have to get there, you know, you're six hours away. You know, if if she was to need me, it would be the longest six hours of my life to get to her. You know, she's not just around the corner at the mall or at a friend's house where I can go protect her, help her, be there to support her. She's away at school. So um, she wanted to live off campus for her last year with two other young women who are also at the University of Virginia. So I drove down with her mom. We looked at a place, and we chose a place. I'm driving back, and she calls me and asks me, Dad, when you bring my things down, and she gave me a list of things, please bring me a pair of your old shoes or boots. Wow. So why would she want a pair of my old shoes or boots? She wanted a pair of my old shoes or boots because she wanted to put them outside the door. Why did she want to put boots, my boots outside the door? Because she felt that she needed the presence of a man. Why would she need the presence of a man? Because she doesn't feel safe in Charlottesville. They don't know me in Charlottesville. You know, and um, while most men are not going to be abusive, there's about 15% of men who do the things we don't want them to do. 85% of us don't. We're good guys. So most men are not going to harm her, but she doesn't know that because her experience as that 21, 21, or 22-year-old girl is that the world is not safe for me as a woman, right? So yep. I want the men in the audience in particular to think about that. They can even ask the women in their lives, their daughters, their wives, sisters, moms, do you do things through your day to feel less at risk for being assaulted by a man? And all of them will have a story to tell because even though most men are not going to do harm to women, they, women have to move through the world as if all of us are of harm. So what I'm, my call to the audience, the men in your audience is that we have to take responsibility for all that we do in our community. It's not just about me being a good guy and protecting my family or being there to support my family. It's about what kind of world is being created for women and girls. And let's envision a world where men and boys are loving and respectful and women and girls are valued and safe. And that's great. That's a great story, Ted. And and it's so it so punctuates one of the aspects of male privilege, which is I would never even have to think about that. That's right. I would never think that I've got to have a woman's shoes outside my door in order to feel safe. And I I think that that's really crucial for us to to examine this this notion of male privilege. And in fact, I, I feel like you can't really look at male privilege without also saying, 
white male privilege or white heterosexual male privilege because all of these things are so tied together. We're going to take a break now and we'll be back in just a few minutes. And Ted, I, I think maybe in the last little bit of time we've got, we might talk a little bit about privilege and a little bit about the myth of anger as the problem and anger management as the solution because this is a myth that the problem with assault against women is anger and that the solution is anger management. You can start with either one of those. Oh, wonderful. I would love to just address the myth of anger management, uh, that it's about anger. So um, I ran, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, I ran the largest program for domestic violence offenders in the country um, from 1996 to 2008. I was building a call to men simultaneously. And um, there's two stories that, there's two experiences that come up around anger management that really make, make the point. So I want to just share one with you. So uh, in, in New York City, uh, there's so much domestic violence, so many domestic violence cases, they actually have domestic violence courts and domestic violence designated officers, right? So, uh, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big issue, which makes sense because this is the biggest city in the country, so you have the largest issue in the country. Um, so when I started the program, I would go out on police calls. So I'd be with the officers uh, responding to 911 calls. And I remember one call in particular. Um, we were going to, I was in the car with the officers, and we got a call. And it was in the Bronx on Jerome Avenue, which is not far from Yankee Stadium. And um, we got a call about a domestic violence dispute. Uh, so... Uh, we went up, and it was a two-story walk-up. Now, as we got to the to the to the front door of the of this building, this apartment building, it was only two stories, and it was a walk-up. Um, we could hear this man yelling and screaming, the woman crying. It was awful. There was things being thrown. It was as as bad as you can. I I I, I get emotionally upset just just telling you about it because I kind of re- remember it so clearly. So we're going up the stairs, and it's getting louder and louder and louder. This man is furious. You can hear his anger. The police officers, two brave officers, a woman and a man, knock on the door and say, this is NYPD, open the door. It got quiet immediately. You could actually hear a pin drop, Ken. And then the man opened the door, put his head out, and said, hello, officers, may I help you? Mm-hmm. And I said, now that's anger mm-hmm. management, isn't it? <laughs> he manages anger. That's fine if there's a consequence, if he doesn't. And that's, the, that's, that's, that's what we do. See, we've always had the latitude as men to do what we want, especially with women in, that we're in relationship with. We've had that latitude. We had that, as you mentioned before, it's been a private issue. That privacy has been served, uh, that privacy serves men. It doesn't serve women, and that's because it's a male-dominated society. So for him to be able to control himself and turn it off, when there was a consequence if he didn't. We see it all the time. When, when, a, when, a, when a player is angry with the coach, he doesn't hit the coach. When an yeah. employee is angry with his boss, he doesn't hit his boss. He figures it out. He, he, he acts respectfully because he knows how to act respectfully. But as men, we've always had the latitude to do what we want in our home because uh, Society has, has uh, allowed that. Our culture has allowed that. Even religion has allowed that. I, I, I really want people to sit with that idea for just a minute because it may be very new. It may be very new to realize that what may look in the moment like out of control behavior punching and screaming and breaking things is actually behavior designed to exert control. It is not out of control behavior. And if you take it apart, as Ted just did with those examples, you will see it every time. He doesn't break his stuff. He doesn't throw his flat screen out the window. He breaks her stuff. He doesn't punch her if, if he wants it to be concealed, the attack, he doesn't punch her in areas where the bruises will be visible when she goes to work the next day. 
He punches her in places where the bruises will not be visible. And he never behaves the way that, one of the things I've heard over and over again is, I could never imagine this man behaving in such a way. And you know, Ted, and I know from working with this population as well, the people who do things that would make your skin crawl and terrify you in private can appear to be the nicest people you would ever want to meet in public, yes. just yes. like everybody else, just like mm-hmm. everybody else. Yes. Yeah. And let me take that a step further. Even when there's alcohol or drugs involved and he's being abusive to her, when the police come, he knows to stop swinging. Yeah. It's like even with the intoxication, the belief system of male dominance, that you belong to me, that I can do what I want, right, is still there. But but also who he doesn't want to hit overrides any of that stuff, even the intoxication. So, and I just want to say something about men who batter and who are abusive, and we are not so far from them because, again, they've right. been taught the same things we've been taught. They just right. may go further than we would. Right. And so I, so, I, so, I, so I really want to say that because as we call men out, and that's important, whether it's Me Too or whether it's domestic violence, we want to call men out because that gives account, that's accountability. It also gives uh, the victim voice. It gives, uh, whether it's a woman or, or, or someone who may not conform to gender, or, 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 um, um, and, and it, it gives that person voice, and it also hopefully provides some healing. So we want to call that out, but we also want to call men in. Even those men who are abusive, we need to call in because it's a learned behavior and can be unlearned and often is generational, meaning they, they witness it as a child and repeat it as an adult because it's what you're supposed to do based on what they've learned. So I just want to put that out there that the hope is that um, men can change. I believe they can. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe they can. And that those men who are abusive are doing so not because it's mental health and mental illness because again right. even with mental yep. illness they knew who, they know who they can be abusive to and who they can't so it's not selective mental illness <laughs> or exclusive mental illness it's, it's either mental illness or it's not it's 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 a very important point that it's not about a mental health diagnosis it's about the taking to the absolute extreme what we've all been taught about who we are in the world, what our rights are, what we're entitled to, and we're entitled to own our partner. If we take it to that extreme, that's our vision. It's not about getting angry. It's about feeling the right of ownership. And that's crucial. And I wanna also echo what you said. There, There is no them, there's only us. <laughs> And I've done things on this continuum as well. I've been silent for the jokes. I've expected to be treated differently than women in in many places in the world. I've 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 held in my own unconscious and conscious mind the privilege that I will be listened to responsibly by anybody. I take that for granted, which is not something that women can necessarily expect. And there's a whole host of other of other ways, but we need, we need all of us men to look at this. And because because it, it's even beyond intimate partner violence and sexual assault, it's war, it's an assault on the environment. It's the, it's the idea of dominion, of ownership, rather than communion, participation yeah. with. Yeah. It's all of that. So this is as big as civilization and, and history. And so in, in just a couple minutes, Ted, what are some recommendations that you'd like people to take away or some thoughts that you'd like people listening to this conversation to take Thank away? You. Well, first of all, I want to just mention one thing you had said um, in the uh, earlier segment, you had mentioned around privilege and, and male privilege and white privilege and um, you know, able body. There's all kinds of privileges that exist. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I, I happen to be an African American man, and uh, one of the things that excites me about this work is that it gives myself and white men and other men common ground, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm not saying this is just about you. This is about us. Yep. So I really like that it gives us common ground to work on around this male privilege piece. 
So what we really want uh, men to do in particular is to, again, in, embrace, uh, f express a full range of emotions, don't conform to always be in control and be fearless, value a woman's life and treat uh, all people equally and promote the betterment of humanity, don't use language that denigrates women and girls, develop an interest and experience of women and girls outside of sexual conquest and teach our boys to do that. We have a curriculum, Live Respect. People can download it for free. There's a webinar. You can become certified in this Coaching Healthy Respectful Manhood. It's for middle school and high school boys. And one of the questions that we asked the boys before we created the curriculum as we were developing it, high school boys all around the country from all different backgrounds, your community and mine, the listeners for your, your community and mine, all different boys, good boys. We asked high school boys, do you know what consent is? Mm -hmm. Only 19% mm -hmm. of our boys knew what consent is. Eight out of 10 boys could not define consent. Well, that explains so much, Ken. It explains sexual yep. assault in the military. It explains sexual yep. assault on college campuses. It explains why girls between 16 and 24 are at the highest rate of being sexually assaulted. It explains why Maya, my daughter, I didn't give her name earlier, her name's Maya, why she wanted shoes outside of her door. Because our boys think no means try harder. And that's yep. what we've taught them. And men yep. have to teach the boys differently. It lands differently that when dad says it than when mom says it. It lands yep. differently when a man says it than when a woman says it. So we want men to really develop a voice because the more we increase and promote healthy and respectful manhood, the more we decrease and prevent domestic violence and sexual assault and bullying, listen to women and validate their experiences, challenge the harmful messages that we've received around gender, because this man box that I talked about earlier, the glue that keeps the man box together is homophobia. It, 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 it's, it's harmful to all of us. Um, we want to um, um, do everything we can to support men, women, girls. And one women, more thought. And, and, One more. Uh, well, just uh, please, if people can check out the TED Talk on our website, uh, I think that'll be worth your while to share with other people. Great. It's been wonderful having you. Ted Bunch is one of the co-founders of a call to men.org and you should indeed listen to the TED Talk by Tony Porter, his mm -hmm. co-founder, and learn everything you can from this organization. It's a tremendous organization. Thanks so much, Ted. Next week, we'll be talking with Terry Howard. She's a senior director at FEI Behavioral Health, and we'll be talking about racism, sexism, and homophobia at work. Please join us. I'm Ken Dolan Del Vecchio, and you've been listening to Work Life Confidential. I'd like to thank our executive producer, Randall Libero, and our engineer, Josh, and thank you so much for being with us, as always. Have a good week.